All right. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, thanks for, for listening. I'm going to talk about uh, sparse Galeski factorization by Kobeck Leibler minimization, which is joint work with Matthias Katzfuß at Texas A&M University and Humal Hadi at Caltech uh, in the audience. So I start out by lining out the setting for our rigorous results. So we, we assume we're giving a domain omega and RD with a Lipschitz boundary. So something nice like that. And an L mapping the uh, HS, so the Zobolev space of uh, um, S differentiable functions to its dual. Um, so really, you should think of uh, an elliptic, uh, elliptic partial differential operator. So for instance, something like there's a bilar fashion here. And um, in particular, the important thing is that the, the regularity of the operator is such that the solution space is embedded in the continuous function. So pointwise evaluation makes sense. And we, we see in a moment why that is important. And finally, we now take G to be the Green's function of this partial differential operator. So it's inverse in the sense of convolution. So if you take an F and you convolve with G, and then you apply the differential operator, you get the F out again. And with directly, this is with directly boundary conditions, so zero boundary conditions. OK, so far so good. And now we're going to select a, uh, a set of points xi in this omega here, such that the points are roughly homogeneously distributed in the sense that the ratio between the largest gap without any points and the smallest distance between two points or a point in the boundary is uniformly bounded. And uh, then we plug in pairs of these points into the, 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 Green's, mat uh, the, the Green's function and obtain what I will call the Green's matrix. Uh, so this uh, uh, matrix theta ij. And uh, for our purpose, we assume that we know omega and where the xi's are. And we have some kind of access to entries of the theta, but we don't have an analytic form of L or G. And yeah, so the qu first question, of course, is like, why should we care about this? And uh, in fact, it turns out that these type of systems are quite ubiquitous in uh, applied mathematics. So the first example is, of course, computational physics, computational engineering, where we have uh, systems given by is, uh, I mean, simply described by elliptic partial differential equations. And so for instance, like pressure terms in Navier-Stokes or um, uh, electrostatics, or I mean, many other examples uh, where uh, elliptic partial differential equations occur in, in nature. But there's also uh, an important application in Gaussian pro statistics where these matrices theta, uh, they basically are the, the natural choice of covariance matrices for smooth Gaussian processes. So if we do Gaussian pro statistics and we want to encode uh, smoothness prior into our estimator, we would want to use these, these kinds of thetas as our covariance matrix to do estimation. And similarly, in the kernel methods, um, we would use the theta as basically uh, representing an inner product between feature vectors. And again, somehow encoding a notion of relationship between nearby data points. And so for instance, uh, like this is like roughly how, how you would expect this theta to look like. So we have a strong correlation for nearby points. And then as you move away from each other, uh, the correlation becomes weaker and weaker. And in these applications, we, we are interested in sort of computing a number of computational primitives that often read from the bottlenecks of these, um, of these computations. So in the more physics examples, we oftentimes are interested in simply doing matrix vector multiply with this data. So that basically means like coming up with a solver for the elliptic partial differential equation, multiplying the Green's matrix with a vector. Or we are interested in computing uh, with the single layer boundary uh, boundary element method. So we somehow have to invert a uh, basically the Green's matrix on the boundary of some domain and multiply it with the coupling between boundary and interior. In Gaussian pro statistics, we we are interested in computing conditional expectations to get an estimator, uh, computing conditional covariances in order to uh, get uncertainty quantification of this estimate, and also to compute marginal li log likelihoods in order to um, you know, to tune our hyperparameters. And finally, we might also be interested in simply sampling from this Gaussian process. The problem in all these applications is that theta is dense. So even storing theta takes sort of quadratic complexity. And computing these other operations using Koleski factorization is uh, scales cubically in the number of degrees of freedom. And um, Therefore, basically, the name of the game is now: Can we uh, can we somehow somehow beat this complexity? Because in statistics, 
spatial statistics points. So we might have many data points in application to partial fetch equations. You might have very fine grids, so many degrees of freedom. And uh, so this uh, cubic complexity or quadratic complexity becomes prohibitive. And so there's a huge literature that basically tries to better exploit the specific structure of this theta to do things, to do propose arguments that are faster than, uh, um, than just applying naive Koleski factorization to the matrix. And what, what we are basically doing in this work or proposing is a method so that for an accuracy parameter epsilon, we first reorder the rows and columns of theta. We then select a sparsity pattern S that only has uh, near linearly many entries. So more exactly uh, with a logarithmic factor of, of D where D is the spatial dimension of the problem. And then we compute a lower triangular matrix such that and a transpose, so if we interpret this lower triangular matrix as a Koleski factorization, uh, is, is, the, is an approximate Koleski factorization of the inverse of theta, up to, with approximation uh, up to this uh, epsilon. And we claim that this can be done in complexity n log to the 2d of n over epsilon. And then once we have this, um, uh, this L, we can compute all these other, uh, other quantities in, in near linear time, simply because right, we, we have a, a sparse L that we can use to, and we can use forward and back substitution to quickly invert this L, which means applying theta. We can just multiply the theta to obtain the inverse. And we um, just like sum up the, uh, the logs of the diagonal entries to get the log determinant. And this is, as far as we're aware, really the best computation complexity in the literature for this problem in the, in the level of generality that I, I outlined in the beginning. This method also has uh, some practical advantages. So one is that it has surprisingly small constants. So for instance, in a Gaussian process regression problem, it allows to invert matrices of a million, million by a million in about 10 seconds on a single core. Um, it also um, has, a, has an optimality property in KL divergent, which ensures that the approximation is always positive definite. So a problem with these, with these matrices, like with this theta, is basically that they have some very small eigenvalues. And so it's, it's very, it's, it can be hard to get these small eigenvalues correctly. And if you don't, you, you get a lot of instability. But because of some optimality properties of this uh, approximation, we actually, we will always be away from, from, from zero. We, uh, the spectrum of our method will always be bound away from zero. And um, interestingly, the columns of this uh, low triangular matrix L can be compute embarrassingly parallel. So basically you can split this, like the matrix, the columns of this matrix into uh, many, different, uh, many different batches and send them per email if you want to laptops all over the world and they can compute their individual columns and then they can send them back to you. So even though this is a global problem in some sense, computation of this L is uh, embarrassingly parallel, which uh, allows this method to be uh, extremely scalable. Also, in many cases, one doesn't even need to form L, which uh, allows us to further reduce the space complexity that's often kind of, kind of critical for these direct methods. And uh, we, we are able to extend this, uh, this approximation also to sums of independent processes, which is a, has been a long standing issue when applying similar techniques in spatial statistics. And finally, in order to, um, to apply our method, we really only need pairwise distances of the points xi. So in particular, if these xi are some uh, da data that has some low intrinsic dimension, but lives in a high dimension m in space, we can still apply our method uh, without really even noticing the high dimension m in space. And so I'm going to start with uh, some background, which is uh, earlier work with uh, Tim Sullivan and Humano Khadi. Um, that sort of in some sense is a precursor of this method. And then from there, we'll develop the, the algorithm that I just described. So in this precursor, we again, we were computing Koleski factors of theta directly. So we again would reorder theta, select the sparsity pattern, and compute a lower triangular factor. And as you, you see here in blue, basically the additional price that we were paying in this, uh, in this uh, earlier work. So we have a logarithmic uh, factor in the space complexity and two logarithmic factors in the time complexity. And of course, I mean, a logarithmic factor 
one could say, oh, what's the logarithm factor? But I mean, in practice, I mean, these factors can, like for example, this uh, square logarithmic factor here can end up being on the order of like 50 or 100 or something. So really something noticeable. And uh, so now I'm going to uh, first uh, explain to you how we did this reordering for this uh, for this old old version of the algorithm, and then from from there I progress to the to the new version. So for the old version, right? We, again, we we want to compute Koleski factors, so we somehow need to um, reorder our degrees of freedom. And the way we reorder the degrees of freedom is as follows: we at each step we keep selecting the point that is furthest away from the boundary of the domain and the other points that we have selected. So we start with this point, and then we select this point because we want to be away from the boundary and away from the point that we selected. And we keep doing this. And at, at the same time, we, we also take note of this LK, which will be sort of what I'll call to the length scale of the point, which is the distance to the nearest point that we have already picked or to the boundary at the point where the, at the like when the point is picked. So the length scale of this will be uh, this radius because that's the distance to the nearest points and to the boundary. And that's really how we're going through the entire, uh, through sort of all the points, and then we order them in the order which we picked them. And next, we want to select a sparsity pattern. So um, to, to do this, what we will say is we say, Right, this point x1, for instance, has the length scale given by this, um, by this radius. And now we say we multiply this length scale with a tuning parameter rho that just gives us a trade-off between sparsity and accuracy. And we say all the points, so this first column corresponding to this first degree of freedom, contains non-zeros on all the points that are within this radius, this length scale times the tuning parameter rho. So at the first point, we will get a relatively dense column here. But as we are progressing to future columns, because this length scale is shrinking down, also successive, the successive columns will become sparser and sparser. So even though we have a few columns that will be relatively dense, as we progress through the many, many columns, most of them will actually be very, very sparse. Because as we go to finer and finer levels, the, um, the, the length scale of the interaction decreases. And um, so by harmonic sum type argument, one can get the sort of linear complexity of the size of this sparsity pattern. Now we, again, for this old version of the algorithm, we wanted to compute a lower triangular factor. So we remind ourselves that classical Koleski factorization is just these three, four loops and uh, an update rule so uh, given, given inside, and that's where the cubic complexity comes from. Now, what we had proposed in this earlier work is to say instead, okay, we just skip all the operations where one of these entries that are accessed is outside of the sparsity pattern. And I mean, this is sometimes well known as incomplete Koleski or I call zero in the applied math literature. So, on, I mean, of course, because we're skipping steps, this can be computed much, much faster than the dense Koleski factorization, which would also lead us to include some fill in, whereas here, because we're skipping everything that's offset of a sparsity pattern, we're progressing much faster, and we don't have any fill-in. And so the, the claim with this method is that it actually allows us to um, uh, obtain this uh, exponentially accurate approximation, which should be surprising because we've really done two extremely crude approximations. We have first, we have selected this dense matrix theta, and, and selected without looking at any of the entries, only near linearly many entries of the matrix theta, never really, never even looking at the remaining entries. And then afterwards, we, we, we throw away all these entries and we get terrible approximation of, because of that. And then afterwards, we do Koleski factorization, but we skip all but near linearly many, many of these cubic, uh, cubic flops that we have, would have to perform as part of the Koleski factorization. So two times we have uh, applied an extremely crude approximation. Now, why does it work? The, the reason uh, why this works is that really theta already has almost sparse Koleski factors in the right ordering. So here on the left, you see theta with a, just an exographic ordering. So where they just go like, like this. So this is a physical domain and you see the ordering kind of goes like this and then goes like this and, and so on. So lexicographic. And you see the Koleski factor is almost dense. Like there's just a little bit of when the 
when it starts getting a little smaller towards the end, but mostly it's just the dense matrix. Whereas if we do this maximum ordering and compute the Kolesky factorization, we see that the resulting Kolesky factor is almost sparse. And this is, so the, the magnitude of the entries that I've plotted here is on a log 10 scale. So basically anything remotely blue is essentially zero. So this dense matrix has an almost sparse Kolesky factor, which in some sense, um, yeah. And now that is, again, should come surprising because I mean, there's a huge industry concerned with computing sparse Kolesky factors of sparse matrices. And, and there one observes that one starts with something sparse and then one has to work really, really, really hard to prevent it from becoming denser as we do Kolesky factorization. Now, here we have the opposite thing. We start with something dense and as we do Kolesky factorization, we're claiming that the matrix somehow sparsifies. But it's actually a very uh, intuitive way of understanding this phenomenon. So we look at a, if you look at a, we assume that this, uh, we have a random variable X that has this theta, uh, that's a Gaussian with a theta as a covariance matrix. And now we assume we look at a single step of block Kolesky factorization. And really, I mean, Kolesky factorization is just to iteratively apply this identity, always to apply to, to the lower right block matrix that is remaining. And then collecting all the lower triangular factors that were sort of split off to both sides along the way. Now if we look at this identity, for anyone who has worked with Gaussian process before, we immediately see two important quantities. These, uh, these, these matrices here, they basically give us the conditional expectation of uh, the sort of the second block of variables, condition of the first block. Similarly, this uh, matrix here gives us the conditional covariance of this second block of variables, condition of the first one. And these, I mean, these formulae are not new. I mean, people knew that they had this form before. The novelty is just in connecting this to the fact that, to how these formulae also appear in the Kolesky factorization. Because what this really tells us is that conditioning of a Gaussian random variable is equivalent to uh, Gaussian elimination. So it's the same as if we are sort of taking a stochastic process and keep con conditioning it on more and more degrees of freedom. That's in some sense, in, immediately equivalent to taking the covariance matrix and eliminating uh, rows and columns one after the other in the same ordering. And this tells us something very interesting about the nature of Kolesky factorization, because it says that whenever we have conditional near independence in our Gaussian process, we have almost sparsity of our Kolesky factors. And again, from this point, like in the probabilistic perspective, it's a very common phenomenon that we start with some stochastic process that is densely correlated, but after sort of conditioning on the right degrees of freedom, we end up with a, uh, uh, with a uh, sort of much decorrelated process. Like if you basically condition on the degrees of freedom that, that couple the different parts of the process, then after, after sort of fixing them, the, the remaining process might decorrelate. So this is a very common phenomenon in uh, Gaussian post regression. But on the other hand, in the Kolesky world, we hadn't really observed the fact that there are interesting dense matrices with sparse Kolesky factors, but this intuition and sometimes tell that there ought to be some, just because this phenomenon is so prevalent in, in, uh, in the probabilistic world. And now, what is the source of conditional independence and therefore of sparsity in the Kolesky factors for these systems that you're looking at? And in fact, this, um, the source of conditional independence has been observed at least phenomenologically and with some extent also uh, analytically in the spatial statistics literature and it's called the screening effect. And the idea of the screening effect is really that if I, um, right, so I think the, the best way of thinking about it is that really like if, imagine you have a smooth random process and I ask you to estimate the, the value of the process here and I give you the value at a very nearby point then you probably wouldn't pay me a lot of money to also know the value over here because you would say the nearby point carries more information about this point than this point all the way over here. And that in turn means that condition on this nearby point, the target point and the point over here are almost uh, independent of each other. And that is really what the um, screening effect is about. That if we, for instance, here we have a matern covariance, so a basic covariance of a smooth random process, and we're conditioning it on just these four points. And we see that after we condition these four points, the, the correlation length drastically decreases. And again, as we've seen before, this, is, this really also implies a sparsity of the Kolesky factor. 
And then the sort of ordering in sparsity pattern that we've uh, seen just now is really motivated by this, where if we say that we, we have conditioned on the red points, and there is these two green points that we haven't conditioned on yet or that we haven't eliminated yet, are sort of further away than the density of these red points, then we can expect them to be conditionally almost independent after we have conditioned on these red points. And that really, that's really what motivates the choice of ordering and sparsity pattern that I just described. And, um, and, and yes, yeah, so by, by doing this uh, incomplete Koleski factorization, we, we observed this uh, sort of old version of the algorithm, which at the time was uh, already the, I think, the best, com best computation complexity for this problem. But there were a number of things where we thought we, we should be able to do better. And in particular, right, the, the nice thing is it's a simple algorithm, just incomplete Koleski factorization. And it's also, I mean, we can quite easily implement with shared memory. It doesn't have many tuning parameters and already has this property that uses intrinsic, like the sort of low intrinsic dimensionality of the data if it is available. But there were a, a number of still sort of shortcomings in this uh, first iteration of the algorithm, in particular that the constants are still relatively huge. And um, with this, like this, this one additional log factor in the space complexity looks kind of uh, uh, innocent. But then again, if you have like a factor 10 in your memory requirements, that actually can be a huge thing. And then if one wants to move to bigger problems and one has to do distributed implementation, then again, one has a problem that one will have to deal with the communication cost between the different workers in the distributed setting. And finally, there's a, I think some of the most pressing issue was really uh, how to deal with the noise covariances. So assuming that I, I, I'm modeling my data as a Gaussian process given by the CEDA and then some additional IID noise that I add to my measurements. Because the problem is, if, if, if our uh, measurements are corrupted by noise, this whole idea that after I condition just a few points, everything becomes independent, this idea is greatly weakened. Because when I condition on my measurement, I don't actually, this doesn't actually give me that much information about the underlying smooth process. And so what we would see here is that in this problem, if you compute the Koleski factors, we see that as we're increasing sigma, so this additional noise covariance, the sparsity of the Koleski factor actually uh, diminishes drastically. And that was a big, uh, really big concern because we, I mean, one reason to include many data points in a Gaussian process setting is that we have noise that we want to average out over the data points. So that's some of the most interesting scenario of application. But then if we cannot apply our method to the setting, it's, it's kind of sad. And um, in fact, this has been for, for uh, approximation based on screening effect, this has been the, I'd say the, the major issue in the spatial statistics community in applying these methods based on the screening effect that they somehow don't seem to be able to deal well with uh, observational noise. And now this leads us to the question, can we factorize theta inverse instead? So, so far we have Koleski factorized theta, but can we factorize theta inverse? And there's, I mean, again, like from the probabilistic perspective, so theta uh, ij is the covariance of xi and xj. Whereas a theta inverse ij is the conditional correlation of xi xj on all the remaining variables. So and this is also called the precision matrix in Gaussian post statistics. So from that point of view, there, there's already a lot more conditioning just happen naturally even in the original matrix. So we would think that all oh, that helps in getting even sparse, sparse matrices. Or in, in a, a different way of looking at this that from the PDE perspective, Theta inverse is kind of like a differential operator, whereas theta is an integral operator. So we would somehow hope that theta inverse is much sparser, and therefore can also in principle be factorized in a more sparse way than theta. And uh, it, indeed, it turns out that the Koleski factors of um, this theta inverse are sparser by this uh, log n factor than the original uh, than the um, Koleski factors of theta. And one nice way to think about that, which also maybe helps to reinforce the, uh, or remind again how the sparsity was, pattern was constructed is as follows. So we assume we have the blue points which live on a coarser scale, and we have the red points that um, live on a finer scale. Oh, and I should say one important thing is the, the um, theta inverse is factor, the right ordering for theta inverse is exactly the reverse ordering of what we've used so far. So in the, in the past, what we have done is we compute the 
cost to fine order computes cost to fine Kolesky factor of theta of theta, and then we will have this like there's a degree of freedom on the cost scale that will interact with many 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 fine scale degrees of freedom. Because all these fine scale degrees of freedoms are sort of in the interaction radius of this theta, because this interaction radius is the length scale times some tuning parameter rho. And then afterwards, the idea why this is efficient is that most of the degrees of freedom will be fine scale degrees of freedom, and they have a much smaller interaction radius, and so they have a fewer degrees of uh, fewer non-zeros in the respective column. But now the interesting thing in uh, when when factorizing this uh, theta inverse in the reverse ordering is that now the um, now the theta uh, sorry now the cos scale actually comes later comes after the fine scale. So by the time we, we factorize the, the cost scale here, all the orange points, the fine scale points have, have been dealt with. So they cannot even appear here anymore. So whereas here this, uh, the, the, the cost scale, um, the cost scale degree of freedom has lots and lots of non-zeros because of the fine points. Here by the time the cost scale degree of freedom, again, this is in reverse ordering. Uh, here by the time the cost scale degree of freedom is being factorized, all the fine scale points have been taken care of. So we still only have very few entries in this um, column. Whereas the, the sparse, uh, sorry, the fine scale here comes earlier. So in principle, it sees the blue, the, the blue points, but there are just so few blue points that th this doesn't really uh, affect, the, um, affect the amount of sparsity at all. So yeah, so long story short, by using the reordering of the, um, of the maximum ordering, the inverse Kolesky factors of theta or the Kolesky factors of theta inverse actually have an even greater amount of sparsity than the, um, uh, than the Kolesky factors of, uh, of theta. Another nice thing about this is that the sparsity uh, does not deteriorate when adding, uh, when adding noise variance. So, and the, the, the way of seeing this, I think is really that if we add, if we start with a theta, so with a Green's matrix of elliptic PDE, and we add, uh, we add a diagonal term, basically a white noise term, then the result, the sum of these two, is not the Green's matrix of any elliptic partial differential equation, because it's somehow too too singular on the diagonal to be the Green's matrix of any partial differential equation, elliptic partial differential equation. However, if we if we look at theta inverse, and again, theta inverse is a kind of a partial differential operator, and we add the identity, that really just amounts to adding a zero order term to the elliptic partial differential operator. So that's why we can add as many, uh, like as strong a, a zero order term to this uh, partial differential operator, and it will still be within our, within our theoretical framework, and therefore we see that the sparsity of this inverse Kolesky effect is, does not deteriorate at all. And this allows us to apply the trick where we say we take our theta plus, plus the diagonal term, then we factor out the theta. And so we can write as theta times theta inverse plus the diagonal term. And now we can separately factorize this uh, theta the way we did before. And we can factorize theta inverse plus identity in the reverse ordering. So this P double arrow um, indicates reversal of the ordering. So we can simply apply our screening based approximation two times once to this factor here, which will behave nicely even for a large, for a large sort of noise variance. And to this, uh, to this uh, theta here that, that uh, uh, is just the, the, uh, basically the, the noiseless process to which we already know that our method applies. So these are really the, the, the at, at least at first were sort of the main benefits that made it they seem like, oh, we, we should really try to learn how to compute the Kolesky factors of theta inverse. The first is that the computational complexity is smaller because the pattern is even sparser. Again, because it's somehow the one, it's a, the theta inverse somehow related to a differential operator, which naturally is sparser than the integral, than things related to the integral operator. And the second, and it's the more important thing is that really this would finally allow us to deal with these annoying noise covariances that have bothered us and everyone else who was relying on the screening effect for so long. Because then we can finally apply this little algebraic trick where we split this problem into uh, the theta problem and the theta inverse plus identity problem. 
And in fact, one can even extend this framework to any sort of sums of uh, operators that, that fall into our framework. But the problem then is how do we compute this? Because again, we, we have only access to theta and we want to compute the Koleski factors of theta inverse. So we cannot just do Gaussian elimination because that would give us the Koleski factors of theta, but we want the Koleski factor of theta inverse. And there's a naive approach that actually would theoretically allow us to compute it in the, sort of the optimal time complexity. But this, uh, uh, and I won't go into details of how we can do this, but there is like a sort of Gaussian elimination style approach, but that doesn't work. And in fact, even if we take the true Koleski factors of theta inverse, just computed densely, which is computationally feasible, and then truncate them, the result is very unstable. In some sense, I mean, the, the intuition, I think, why this happens is that, that the sort of very ill-conditioned the, the inverse of theta is falling onto, onto our truncation error, and that blows up the truncation error enormously. So the, the traditional way is even the somehow the gold standard, what we would have thought of as the gold standard before, computing the full Koleski factor and then just truncating it. Uh, the traditional ways do not actually seem to yield practical algorithms. And so then the, I mean, what really result, what we helped with this was uh, to look for new ways to compute lower triangular factors that are not Gauss elimination. And in particular, uh, a variation approach where you say, maybe we can select a best Koleski factor according to some notion of goodness among all the ones with a given sparsity pattern. So, and this was really motivated by uh, the work on uh, nonlinear transformers by Yusuf Mazog and this group, where they uh, try to estimate this transport map by minimizing the KL divergence between sort of a the transported distribution and the target distribution. And at first I was a bit hesitant that that would be useful for um, fast linear algebra because this, I mean, the KL is a non quadratic uh, target function. So doing this uh, non quadratic optimization problem seemed at first like it could, would not be able to be competitive with the fast linear algebra where, I mean, the competition is, is pretty tough. But it turns out that something very nice happens. So this uh, uh, problem actually has a closed form solution where if we say we, we want to compute this uh, lower triangular factor L as the argmin of uh, over all L that are subject to a certain sparsity pattern. So this S means all the lower triangular matrices that are subject to a, this uh, um, sparsity pattern. And over all of these L, we want to uh, minimize the KL divergence between the uh, sort of the true Gaussian process and the Gaussian process that we obtain by interpreting this L as the Koleski factor of the inverse covariance. So here we have original process, here we have L transpose, that's the inverse covariance, and then we invert it and we get the uh, sort of our approximate covariance. And we want to minimize the K divergence between them. And now there's a closed form, the closed form sort of solution for this K divergence between two Gaussians, which is given here. And what we can now see, okay, we get rid of, of these terms because they don't really depend on n uh, on L, so we left with this. And now this term has a very nice property that it decouples over a um, over a sum of uh, of contributions that each of them only depends on one uh, column of of L at a time. So here, this S K basically like imagine like the the kth column of the of L has this sparsity pattern, then SK just amounts to the sort of contracted matrix where we've just basically taken all the non-zeros and written them in a shorter vector. And so the objective decouples, um, decouples uh, like that, where each of these summons only depends on one column of L. And in particular, um, I mean, we can, we can derive optimality conditions for this. So the closed form solution for this column uh, for the kth column is given by this term here, where E1 is the vector that has a one in the first coordinate and zeros everywhere else. And, um, and this theta SK is again, is the sort of theta uh, restricted to all the um, uh, in, uh, rows and columns in this uh, sp sparsity pattern of the kth column of L. And in particular, these uh, columns can be computed independently of each other. This uh, uh, this closed form solution has been 
observed in, in three uh, separate literatures before uh, independently. One is in the spatial statistics where, where it's called the Vec approximation. However, where people didn't know about anything about the optimality properties of this uh, formula of computing columns of L. The second one is the, in the sparse appropriate inverse community where people uh, obtained this as a minimizer of the so-called Caprin condition number and as a minimizer of this fidelity term subject to a diagonal scaling constraint. And finally, also in the work on uh, nonlinear transfer maps with, uh, with a different goal um, by, by, by Yusuf Mazuk's group. One annoying thing is that, that still, remember, we, for each of the columns, we have, to invert this, uh, we have to invert this matrix here. And so SK is the, this, um, is the number of entries per, um, so the, the number of entries per, um, per column of our sparsity pattern. So this will roughly scale as rho to the D. Remember rho is this, um, uh, is this uh, radius of the sparsity pattern. So the problem is that then we need to invert such a rho to the D sized matrix for each column. So we end up with a complexity n times rho to the 3D, which is, can be even more than what we had in the past. So how, question was how can we prove this? And the idea is that one can try to find columns that have very similar sparsity patterns and then slightly make them slightly bigger so that the sparsity patterns are subset of each other. So here you see we have like three, three columns and like they are all like they're almost the same but 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 not quite and then we can just say okay we it might be good to accept making them a bit bigger so having to deal with a, a bit more computation but in such a way that they're all subset of each other and what then happens is that we can actually compute the Koleski factor only of the biggest of these matrices so the the matrix corresponding to this first column and then it turns out that sort of sub matrices of this Koleski factors will be the Koleski factors we need for, for the remaining columns. So we really only need to do, to pay one cubic complexity to compute the Koleski factor of this biggest um, sparsity pattern. And we can then recycle this Koleski factor to invert all the, uh, all the other matrices appearing in the updates of these columns. And uh, for this sort of geometric sparsity pattern that we're dealing with, where now we have a, we have our different points and these points interact with points within like rho times some length scale. So naively we would have a bunch of points that they all have their own rates of interaction. But instead we can then say, okay, we, we let, for example, this point here would not have interacted with this point in the past, but now we can just say, okay, all of these points interact in the, in the inside of the circle, the orange points interact with all points within the outer circle. So again, we have made this sparsity pattern a, a, bit fa a bit bigger, but therefore the sparsity patterns of all these different points, so or, of the corresponding columns, uh, become all a subset of each other. So we, we perform this operation here where we have a bunch of uh, almost like a bunch of similar columns and replace them with the um, uh, re replace them with columns that are a subset of each other. And this way, we 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 can improve the computation complexity from n times rho to the 2D uh, to the 3D to n times rho to the 2D, which uh, is a big D in the sense that this is really the, the best uh, as a complexity available for this problem. There are also some other nice properties of this method. For instance, that if we are doing GP regression, so we want to compute the posterior mean, we can actually, we actually don't even have to form this matrix L. So we can uh, uh, get away with uh, with com uh, space complexity really linear in N. Basically because we keep computing individual columns of L and immediately uh, applying them to the, the matrix theta. And one other nice thing is that this also is a, leads to a, a, uh, an algorithm where you have a very low amount of communication between different workers in the parallel setting compared to the amount of flops that they, that they are, ha have to compute before communicating again. So again, it makes this algorithm even more uh, amenable to, to being implemented on, on, on large scales. And so in summary, we have this and to complexity computing the ordering. I didn't have time to talk about this in detail here, but this can be on O of n log n. Then again, sparsity pattern can be computed in O of n log n. And then performing G3 regression is in n times log to the 2D. Uh, but this therefore can be done in, in embarrassingly parallel. And the overall space complexity is even linear, linear in N. 
Now, one other interesting consequence of the optimality property of our approximation is that it can be helpful um, to include the prediction points uh, uh, in a Gaussian process regression setting. So assume we have a we have like some points in this i pred. So these are the points where we want to predict the value, and we have a point in i train, which are the the, the points where we know the value where, that we want to use for the prediction. And then to compute the posterior mean, we would have to compute this quantity here. Um, but there, there, would be, there are two problems with this, actually. So the first is that we still, even though we might be able to efficiently factorize this training covariance here, we still have to compute this training, or training prediction covariance. So the, basically, the interaction, interaction between the training points where we know the value and the prediction points where we want to predict the value. And this is still, if basically, if the number of points we want to predict is of the same order as training points, this can still be very large. And the second problem is that even though this, uh, because of the KL optimality, this training approximation of the train covariance will always stay positive definite, it could be that this joint covariance becomes near singular, which uh, greatly diminishes the, the um, stability of the approximation. However, the, the one uh, sort of nice, uh, variant of, of our approximation that's motivated by the K um, optimality is really to apply the K minimization or the K, K minimizing approximation to this joint covariance, which ensures that our, um, that uh, some of the, the K optimality falls on really on the entire problem that we're computing. So we basically, we know even in the low accuracy regime, we cannot really get near singular because that would lead to a large K divergence, which is precluded by the fact that we're optimal in the K divergence. And now I uh, show some um, some numerical examples. So the first is um, is, is, is uh, as I promised before, we are able now to treat this uh, observational noise. So for this example, I'm using a maternity curve with smoothness three over two, and I'm changing varying rho. So rho is this trade-off parameter between accuracy and um, computational complexity, and the noise variance. And I use this approximation where that I mentioned before, where we somehow splitting the theta plus identity and theta times theta inverse plus identity. And indeed, what we see that if we were to naively apply the original approximation, we, we would get a, 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 a pretty large symmetrized k divergence between the two pros and the approximation. Whereas if we are using this uh, Koleski factorization, if we're using this Koleski factorization here, we, we can actually see that our, as both as we're increasing sigma and as we're increasing rho, the approximation improves. And um, one other thing that is, uh, is nice about this is that we can even, basically, we, we can even, when, when we're computing the incomplete Koleski factorization of this matrix here, we, we don't even have to use this. So if we're doing the, computing this Koleski factorization of this matrix here, of course, we're introducing another uh, approximation, even though that's sort of on the, the errors on the same order, we might deteriorate the, the constant in the approximation accuracy. But what's nice is that uh, in practice, we can e still use this exact matrix here and simply use this additional Koleski factor as a preconditioner. And so what we see here is that over, so this is basically the uh, residual as we're using a conjugate gradient with this, uh, uh, this uh, tilde as a preconditioner, that we, we see a very fast conversion of the conjugate gradient. So we can actually work with this exact um, exact term here, instead of accepting any additional error because of um, because of this incomplete Koleski factorization for computing L tilde. And yeah, there's a here I have an example from space statistics where I use a fast Fourier transform to compute realizations of a Gaussian random field, and then compute the the posterior mean and the coverage of the nine percent confidence interval. So we have here we really have two types of prediction points. So the gray points are the points where we are sort of training, the points where we know the value, and we want to predict the values of the red points and the orange points. And of course, the orange points are in a sense because the orange points are form entire regions of sort of unknown values of the process, where the red points are scattered, which is why sometimes predicting the orange points is harder. And here we see the root mean square error, how accurately the posterior mean predicts the um, predicts the true value of the process. Uh, the, the buff line is for the for the sort of regions of points, the orange points here, whereas the line below is for the for the scattered points. And what we see is that we very quickly, even for pretty small values of rho, we are sort of stagnating, which means that 
the error that we're making is is uh, dominated by the statistical by the statistical noise by the variance of the process that we don't have control over, rather than the approximation error of our approximate Gaussian post regression method. So let's so even for something like once we choose Roy to four, basically we can use our approximate Gaussian process regression to do prediction as accurately as the as of the full Gaussian process model. And similarly here, this is the coverage of the 90% confidence interval that we would get from the posterior um, that we would get from the posterior uh, uh, covariance. And again, once we choose rho equal to four, then the the coverage um, uh, approx very closely approximate the 90% nominal coverage. So the, the sort of the, the coverage that the confidence interval should have if we had computed with the exact Gaussian process. Uh, one thing also to notice here, so I, there's the lambda equal to one, lambda equal to 1.3. So th this basically denotes whether we are using this, um, whether we are using this aggregation scheme that I presented earlier, where we slightly increase the sparsity pattern in order to make the, um, in, order, in order to uh, reduce Gillespie factors or not. So if we are doing this, aggregation where we're making this sparse event slightly bigger, of course, we also will be more precise because we're including more points in our approximation. And while this doesn't make a big, much really a difference in the accuracy of the posterior mean, it actually leads to a greatly improved accuracy of the um, uncertainty quantification. Where with the, if we are not doing this, um, if we're not doing this aggregation scheme, if we're not increasing the sparse pattern according to this way, we, we, um, we actually, for very small values of rho, we might not uh, be, be close to the normal value, whereas if we're including this uh, aggregation scheme, even for very, very small values of rho, like rho equal um, close to one, which is basically nearest neighbor interactions, we get a very accurate um, coverage ratio. And yeah, now here I have the, uh, uh, on, on the uh, problem of the same side, the, some, some information about the um, computational time as we're changing rho. So again, rho is the sort of size of the, the trade-off parameter for the size of the sparsity pattern compared to accuracy. And what we, one thing that we're seeing is that, again, this, uh, as our theory predicts, this sort of aggregation scheme really improves the complexity as we are increasing, as we're increasing rho, or as correspondingly as the number of non-zeros in the pattern increase. And in particular, if we, if we are dealing with an exponential where the evaluation of the individual entries of the kernel matrix is relatively cheap, we are able to bring down the computational time to like, to about 10 seconds for matrix of, uh, of, of a million times a million, which I, at least, I mean, that, that's, some, that's a result I was very happy. And this is even like on a single thread. And again, because the method is so trivially parallelizable, it could easily be parallelized to, to many, many more cores, which, which I think, yeah, might allow one to even go to like problems of like a billion times a billion size, which, which I think is quite, uh, quite encouraging. Um, another application more on the sort of traditional applied math, um, traditional applied math angle is uh, boundary element methods. So we want to solve a boundary value, an elliptic boundary value problem, and we want to use the single layer boundary element method, which coincidentally really uh, is the same as using a um, as using Gaussian process regression and regressing, computing the conditional expectation in the inside of the domain, uh, conditional on the um, on the value on the boundary. And because the uh, because the the Green's function of Laplacian is not um, has a singularity at zero, so the resulting functions are not cannot be valued pointwise. We cannot use our measurement points as we did before, because then the interaction of x i with x i would be infinity. So instead, we are going to use local averages, where we have basically a hard type multi-resolution scheme to to um, uh, that we use to discretize the boundaries. So let's say this is this could be one so the domain in this example would be a cube and so one sort of side of the cube could be this whole thing and then on the finer scales we form these sort of orthogonal um orthogonalized wavelets and then we go to even finer scales and so on and so basically what what used to be the sort of core scale points before are now the core scale uh, first order wavelets and as we move to finer points we move to sort of finer and finer hard type wavelets and uh, one thing that is very encouraging about this is that if we are now comparing the, the, the solver that we get by using dense linear algebra to computing the, um, uh, the, the boundary integral solution, 
uh, compared to using our approximate method, even with values of rho as close, as small as 1.0, 2.0, which is almost, really almost only using nearest neighbor interaction, we're able to uh, recover the, the sort of grid size accuracy of our method. And again, like it's, uh, I mean, this, this, there's still some work to, to scale this to more challenging and, and, and bigger uh, integral equations, but I think, yeah, the, the fact how accurate we are, even with these extremely small values of rho, that, that's, that's very encouraging to me. Yeah, so in summary, uh, yeah, this Kulbeck light bulb memorization combined with the screening effect, it's a state of the art complexity for a very classical problem in applied mathematics. And it has a, a number of properties. For instance, this uh, embarrassing parallelism, the, the near space complexity, and the stability in the low accuracy regime that are not really present in the classical multi scale algorithms. Um, for future work, there's, a, I think, a number of interesting directions. One is to write efficient code to be included in ge geostats.jl, that's a Julia package for geostatistics. Um, then uh, we are probably collaborating with uh, Peter Schroeder's group to apply there is a boundary element method, uh, boundary element variant of our method uh, to some interesting problems in fluid dynamics and computer graphics. Uh, there's, so, so far we have, we have found a way to optimally choose the non-zeros for a given sparsity pattern, but I think we now have an algorithm to also optimally select the sparsity pattern itself, which hopefully will further improve the constants. And finally, uh, so far our method only, um, our method needs access to individual entries. And of course, if you, if you have a legacy solver of an elliptic problem, you don't get access to individual entries at cost one, but instead you get access to individual columns of your matrix, which corresponds to solves of this operator with certain right-hand sides at a cost n. So uh, we, um, there, there exists a variant of these methods that, uh, that can also be applied to, to this, this setting, where instead of being able to pick out individual entries, we, we have to apply a solver to different right-hand sides. Okay. And with this, I will conclude. Yeah, thank you very much for your, for your attention.